I'm Chantong Chen. <coughs> I'm reporting the joint work with uh, Yotaka Ilie and uh, Benjamin Meider and uh, Ye Qi Xian. These are three of my collaborators with this work. Uh, if you want some references, you can find it in the archive, and also it's published in the NXT. So this is only a 30 minutes talk, so I'll try to make it very simple and understandable. Fortunately, in the first talk, uh, Professor Ito has introduced many ingredients. So also, after this talk, if you are, wish to uh, learn more about this subject, these are the four basic references I recommend. Of course, this first one is the classic that I think everyone should read. And the second one is the old classic about the matrix models and the two-dimensional gravities. Uh, my, our mo uh, major motivation is based on these three, uh, two works on uh, DKK and also the joint work by Montesina, Cyborg, Moore, and Xi. <coughs> so this is the outline of my report today. Uh, basically, I'll divide my talk into these different sectors. First, I, for, for the introduction, I, I feel I should uh, at least give you some five minutes <coughs> the matrix model, and uh, then I'll explain some techniques we use to solve it, <coughs> namely the orthogonal polynomial techniques. And the third part has to do with how do we transform the discrete systems into a differential system, especially the next pair of formalisms that uh, Ito san also mentioned in the first talk. And then <coughs> our main contribution is to try to uh, uh, write down these uh, generalized round schemes which correspond to the FCT Cardi frames in the matrix model or the string theories. And after that, we can arrange them into a cast title. <coughs> and I'll tell you some basic symmetries associated with this arrangement uh, that we call duality symmetries. <coughs> OK, so this is very elementary and rush introductions. Uh, matrix model is essentially a multi-dimensional calculus. So here we have a matrix variables which is of size n squared. And then we impose a matrix potential, taking trace, make it a number. So <coughs> the basic ingredients in this partition function consist of uh, even ensemble of matrices. And then beta here uh, serve as an inverse fun scale. Uh, usually when we say uh, we are taking the classical limit, that means we send beta goes to infinity or f bar goes to zero. <coughs> And then in the, our study of matrix models, the potential is usually taken to be a polynomial forms, especially the degree of the po uh, polynomial we reflected in uh, as the uh, minimum conformal field theory indices, P and Q. And also, inside this uh, polynomial, there are various coefficients that we call coupling constants. Okay, I don't have time to explain the uh, fishnet approach of this uh, matrix model, which you can check in the records too, I just showed. But the reason we use this to probe two-dimensional gravity is based on the old idea uh, as pioneered by Chu Hu, that since M has two indices as a matrices, when you do Feynman diagram uh, expansion, the Feynman graph is like a fish net. <coughs> in that sense, when you take uh, large N or <coughs> some special scalings, uh, this partition function looks like we are doing some calculations over two <coughs> dimensional random surfaces. So this was thought as an exactly solvable toy model of two dimensional gravities. <coughs> and later on, when people studied uh, some generalization of this by including, for example, two matrices, they found that they can use this to probe the minimum string theories. By minimum string theories, I mean the following. Some people who know gravity may be wondering what do I mean by two-dimensional gravity. Actually, this only means two B. So usually when we speak about minimum string theory, we mean uh, three major uh, compositions of different pieces of physics. <laughs> I don't know what's meant. Plus, uh, as I said, minimum CFT, which is labeled by two in the Finally, because of performance symmetry, also maybe <coughs> okay. So there has been many checks about this matrix model 
implementation and the uh, minimum string theories and uh, at the level of amplitude or at least in the classical regimes in that level. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I, I skipped the discussion about this Riemann surface approach. For me, in order to do real computations, the useful technique is based on the orthogonal polynomial. <coughs> so let me explain what is the idea behind these eigenvalue pictures. So uh, everybody knows that, for example, if I work with Hermitian ensembles, the matrix can be diagonalized in the following ways. Put it differently, that means we can do a polar decompositions, like the usual complex number, you can separate the radial and the angular directions. So for a Hermitian matrix, it's the eigenvalue uh, part is like the radial directions, and the unitary transformation matrix B is like the directional part. <coughs> so before I tell you what is the definition of a function, if you integrate out these angular directions, you are left with these uh, radial coordinates and also the Jacobian. The Jacobian is the famous phantom determinant. <coughs> which can be written in this form, that <coughs> consists of the difference of two eigenvalues and uh, you uh, multiply all the possible k's in this way. <coughs> and if you do this, then, of course, I'm focusing only on the singlet sectors. That means uh, the physical variable I'm calculating today is invariant at the case distribution of B. Okay. You, can, you can consider it more general observable, which is not be a singlet. So one uh, nice interpretation about this eigenvalue picture is that once you transform the original uh, Cartesian integration of path integrals into these polar forms, you can uh, transform these uh, additional Jacobians into the original actions. So everybody knows that if you do this, you can take the log upstairs. So this means that whenever two eigenvalues of the matrices try to get close, they will feel repulsive force because this is plus sign and uh, to get into you take of this extra minus. So <coughs> due to these particular features, even though apparently we start with a single trace operator, that means it looks like the eigenvalues only feel the influence of environment. But due to the presence of minimum uh, factors, actually there's a true body interactions. So in this way, we will say a metrics model also like uh, one-dimensional fermionic problems. But at this stage, I don't have time yet. So it's static configurations. Okay? So once I take large elements, that, that means I have many, many fermions, and they repulse. So for even potential, you can imagine there is a Fermi surface. And the <coughs> level of that in the large element will become the cost of the spectral curve, which I will introduce later. That, uh, I have another pictures of metrics model, which I'll speak to in the rest of the talk. So, uh, as I said, this is very useful to help us to compute partition function of metrics model. So, in the next two pages, I'll briefly tell you what is basic idea. First of all, let us introduce the orthogonal polynomial with respect to the matrix potentials. I think everybody has encountered this in their quantum mechanics courses, for example. So this will serve as a basis for functional space. <coughs> okay. So in this particular setup, I choose the capital P orthogonal polynomial to be of the, uh, the, name. That's the leading coefficient is one. That is a normalized. So if you want to get a normalized one, you have to divide it by square root of h, and this is normalization constant. <coughs> okay. After some manipulations, due to you can rewrite this uh, Vandermonde as a determinant of orthogonal polynomial. Use this column and row uh, uh, elimination or addition, uh, which I show in the next page, you can see that the integral can be done, even though uh, this is n variables. But if you transform the Vanderbilt into a diagonal polynomial, the results is given, the, the results of the partition function is given by the product of normalization constant. Okay, so that, that's the uh, reason why uh, a diagonal polynomial can help us to evaluate the partition functions. <coughs> the other thing is that uh, actually uh, there is a special property of a diagonal polynomial. Since they are a completed basis in the functional space, so naturally they form a representation of Heisenberg algebras. In particular, we wish to know the uh, 
actually our coordinates on the basis and also the derivative on the basis. That will become the basis for the BK system, which I'll also explain later. But for the action of coordinates on the polynomial, there's a famous uh, bridge and recursive relations. So here, because I'm using this particular normalization for polynomials, so the only information is given here. Also, I assume this is an even potential. So there's no term proportional to P then. If this is general <coughs> potential, in principle, there are three terms. Here, I'm, for simplicity, I take only the even parts. So there's only one unknown equation. And there is some integration by part. You can show that this Rn is given by the ratio of normalization constant Hn, which is here. Hn is the normalization we just defined in the previous page. And uh, then uh, you can use that to extract relations about the uh, recursive or yeah, recursive coefficient using the integration by part again. So this is one of the famous uh, discrete kind of equations. <coughs> From here, you can extract information if you want uh, after taking double scaling limit to the susceptibility functions of the partition function, which is the second derivative of the B energy. Okay. So that's the basic idea of using the uh, orthogonal polynomial techniques to understand the physical observable in matrix models. Any questions thus far? Now, let's move on and study another important object in the matrix model, which is called resolvent. Uh, I think this idea is also very similar when you take a course in quantum mechanics. It's essentially it's some kind of green function, where the green function in mathematics implies the inverse of differential operator like Hamiltonians. Here, we also introduce a, a glory of observable Z. And X here stands for the matrix and the previous page. So roughly speaking, I introduce a macroscopic loop operator as the uh, condensation of hope. That, that's what I show you in the earlier pages. Yeah. I said that once you introduce the lambda variables, because the impulsive interaction, they try to condense. So every single eigenvalue uh, acts like a pole. If you sum up with the poles, you get a cost. What I mean by condensation. Yeah. Okay. Why this is interesting? First of all, let, let's take a derivative of these integrated uh, expressions. So, by elementary or fundamental theorem of calculus, you know these are macroscopic loop operators have the derivative with respect to this uh, variable x goes to the canonical resolvent in, in quantum mechanics. And Assuming x is uh, large, then you can do Taylor expansion. Okay, so so the derivative with respect to the additional position of inserted eigenvalues, either it's x or z, <coughs> can be written as a coherent sum of this uh, single trace operator. And look at this. What is this? This is just like a product of matrices. So you can imagine. Uh, sorry, again, the first page is very short, but. For this particular case, if I take k equal to 5, then you have adjacent uh, 5 matrices times together, they form a closed loop. Right? <laughs> That's the meaning of uh, trace of product. So essentially, this particular operator dig a hole on the Riemann's random surface. Okay? That's why it's called a macroscopic loop operators. And also, from this simple picture, as you can imagine, this is a Break. If you remember your string theory courses, that a deep break can be imagined as a boundary language. <coughs> okay, that, that's why these two are connected. Thank you. And uh, later on, I will introduce the idea of uh, spectral, uh, spectral curves. Yeah. This also appeared in the first talk in the morning, which is simply the exploitation value of this. Okay, and due to some uh, simple algebra, you can see that. Uh, if you can compute this, then the position of additional eigenvalue and this uh, exploitation of macroscopic loop operator has some algebraic constraints. Actually, in some sense, these two variables are canonical pairs, like a 
classical mechanics position and the momentum. Okay, so either quantum mechanically is commutator or semi-classically is a Poisson bracket. Okay, so that, that's a key object that will be of interest to later discussion today because <coughs> there's a famous recursive relation which is pioneered by Ehrner and the companies that uh, once you extract the spectral, uh, spectral curve information from the exploitation value of bumper stop loop operators, you can use that as a set of points and iterate all the series to get the full non-protective partition functions. So that's why we are interested in this object. And today I'll generalize the idea of the resultant operator to a higher generalized uh, round scan and study the uh, lax pair associated with that. From that new lax pair, I can extract a different or many different uh, spectral curves. So that, that's the main purpose of this talk. I <laughs> okay, so in the literature, it's the exponential of the microscopic loop operator is also called partition functions. And this level, I think this picture is sufficient for you to make a imagination. Okay, then there's another important and uh, 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 useful Calculation. This is very crucial in the computation of uh, matrix models. Of course, it takes a lot to do this. <laughs> models off. We can show you in the finite n matrix models the resolvent or the microscopic loop operator I just defined. The exposition of value of that is actually the orthogonal polynomials. If you took, take the full, uh, a single, sorry, single loop exposition value. Or uh, you can study the correlation functions of this, meaning that you multiply many, many microscopic loop operators. So I is the different position of that. <coughs> and he has also a nice formula, exact formula of this for finite end. Okay. So if you write it out, it looks like this. Uh, where the denominator is like uh, also a minimum uh, determinant which I defined earlier. So notice the difference of the levels orthogonal polynomials. After a double scaling limit, this will become the derivative. Because for each orthogonal polynomial, there are two labeling uh, data sets. One is the label, the other is the eigenvalues. So now, in order to study the following gravity, I need to take double scaling limit to transform these discrete theories into a continuum. So uh, later on, you'll see that uh, let me, let me go on to say what is the double scaling limit. <coughs> Essentially, uh, this is maybe a little different from the usual perturbative calculation because the existence of a critical coupling, GC, that should be determined from the form of the potential. After that, you take larger limit and also all these uh, coefficients, this is a collective symbol associated with all the coefficient of uh, 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 the coefficient in the potential. So after taking this two limit, now you can transform the discrete variable in the following. This is n, g, and also the level of orthogonal polynomial small n become a new variable data. Okay, later on. Okay, we have three variables, n, g, and uh, small n, that transform into the lattice spacing. This is positive integer, so a equals to zero and n equals to zero. Yeah. And there are two continuous variables corresponding to the original coupling and also the level of orthogonal polynomials. And I also mentioned that the orthogonal polynomial is a complete set, formal representation of Heisenberg algebras. So even though this is tedious and the details, I just tell the results. This is like acting by bond and taking directive. So the Heisenberg algebra on the orthogonal polynomial or the microscopic loop operator, as shown by the work by Morozov, can be rewritten in the uh, double scan limit as a uh, lax pair system, P and Q, where P has to do uh, in the following form that the derivative is acting on T. Okay. And the coefficient functions contain the information of uh, susceptibility function in the partition function. Okay. So naturally, 
you will expect the P and Q will satisfy the canonical computation relations. Essentially, that's idea. So from here, you will get a nonlinear equations of the susceptibility functions uh, in, in the low-level cases, like the pure gravity cases. This is kind of the equation. And the spectral curve can be computed uh, and for many approaches, but essentially the answer is given by Chapter polynomials. Okay. This is uh, has to do with how do you uh, transform these string equations into some uh, scaling functions, and then if you solve the equation associated with scaling functions, you found the polynomial solutions associated Chapter polynomials. So this is the uh, canonical spectral curve for the Matrix model uh, with the uh, conformal indices P and Q. Okay. And usually, because this is a polynomial, so the if you imagine both Q and zeta are compact variables, this is like the uh, Riemann surface is cut. So you have to glue many pieces of uh, compact sheet into a, a global object. And, uh, I can then we'll see on the top. Okay, so I, I just said the, the, uh, the correspondence between the PQ matrix model and the Riemann string theory. So the, in the Liouville theory, we have this grand object because uh, Liouville theory has this exponential growing potential, and you can imagine some string comes here and uh, either they come back or there's some terminal. So. At this point, this, roughly speaking, is the position or zeta variables. So, uh, Cyber Xi has made a study based on this minimum string theories, and they claim that, in general, once you uh, consider the friend object in the minimum string theories, because of this, of course, this is always necessary, so I will not discuss that part. The friend object typically will consist of the tensor product of the FDD term from Rubio and also some matter contribution from PQ. And their prescription is that the bounded general brain object can be written as the elementary one, which uh, after the cement, uh, you say semantic <laughs> notation? Yeah. Okay. Or for why do we call it I think CV also. Similar analysis. Anyway, <coughs> it, it's a rotation of these coordinates of zeta. So uh, here, if the original variable zeta is parameterized by these uh, global parameters for the real surface, tau, then after this particular rotation, the coherent sum will generate general uh, FZZT Cardi uh, Cardi is associated with this part. FZZT is associated with this. That's why we got this name. Okay, that, that's their formula. But, okay, sorry, I didn't talk about motivations. Motivation may be a little technical. So these rotations, starting from a given solution, and then you rotate along the complex plane. But be careful, because uh, there's a famous stock phenomenon. So a given function, the analytic continuation of a given function may not be the other independent solution of the original <laughs> differential. I'm late, right? <laughs> I start late. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, okay, stop now. No. So, the analytic combination of a given fundamental solution may not be the general solution of the original equations. So, uh, our proposal is try to get a non perturbative handle of this by looking at the wrong scales. Okay. So, everybody knows wrong scales. So, our paper is wrong because half of them are dictionaries that we outline all the possible results for different levels. But I'll, in this talk, I'll just give you some one simple example. So this is taken from the easing case, where P equals 3 and Q equals 4. So the P operator, P operator, which are, uh, which are defined the uh, system, 
is given by a third order derivative. So in principle, you would imagine there are three independent solutions. Right? So using that, you can construct one schemes. And you know that uh, there are uh, two out of three, so there are three possible choices. Okay. So this two implies, this, this is two means I choose arbitrary fundamental solution out of this equation for these six steps. So given that, you can take further derivative, and it's easy to check that this Brunskian object itself satisfies the following differential equation. Okay, it's straightforward. Using the original equation, you can get the, the equation for the combinations. But then, I can do a general thing by studying more higher derivative combination, like this. So that's how the young tabula comes in to these games. This is the original definition of one skins. If you add one box, that means I add more one derivative. So you don't do that below because that gives you zero. So the box can only go up there. That means adding the degree of derivative. If you add twice, then either it's here or up there. But up there can be transformed using the equation because I'm working with third order differential equations. So altogether, you find using these young tabular techniques, you get a finite dimensional representation of this FZT Cauli brain. It's closed. Okay. But of course, the calculation technical and the really horrible force, but that's the basic idea. So in the end, you get this, uh, uh, we call it curly B, curly Q, as a monogamy system for the brain system. That is given as follows. This is like uh, transforming the higher order different ODE into a uh, uh, systematic first order differential equation, and this will be the curly B operator. And also for similar calculation, you can extract the Q <coughs> operators. And that was what we call the as a system for the uh, generalized run schemes. And the idea is that we want to know what are the spectral curves associated with this system. Okay. Before I tell you how to extract the <coughs> uh, spectral curve of the elementary object, now I want to see this general. So it is possible to compute because uh, this is essentially based on the original equations. Even though if you compute the BQ string equations like this, you don't get new information on the susceptibility constant, uh, functions because you're using the same equation just acting on this higher derivative. That will not change the constraint on the susceptibilities. The crucial idea for us is that, uh, maybe also was mentioned by Professor Eagles, once I have this autonomic systems, I wish to study scope phenomena. Because the equation changed, I mean, as a linear system. So the hope is that this will give us more constraint to fix the redundancies in the scope phenomena or multiplies we encounter in earlier works. Okay, so that's the motivation. Sorry, I have to explain until this stage. And finally, by Making all these indices going up, uh, we can arrange according to R. All these new brain objects as a generalized run scheme can be arranged as a class tables, and there are symmetry properties. For example, uh, this one should be equal to this. That's what's called uh, refractive symmetry. It's basically uh, high school algebra, P for R equal to. That's the essential idea of uh, refractive symmetries. And also, we have this charge conjugation symmetries. Earlier I introduced the idea of young tabular. So there are some simple manipulations. First you can take complement and then you transpose. Then you can show that these two amplitude or these two isomorphic systems are related by a charge conjugation. Okay. And that are details in our papers if you're interested, you can check. Okay, last page. So uh, there are two parts I want to <laughs> reiterate. First of all, I hope in this talk I show you these procedures. I start from the resolvent and matrix model, and this is Morozov's work, the exact computation. Double scaling limit will bring this into one skins, and we generalize it into a hyper system. And our focus is to study the spectral curve associated with this uh, new system. Uh, there are some technical details we haven't completed in this work. Then in some inner corner, <laughs> we still don't know how to give a well definition. So the first job is to complete the table, and then as the reference four, I show you the second page. 
we are also interested to know the quantum interactions or the exact computation of the spectral curve. Usually we only have semi-classical results as shown in the chapter shift cases. And finally, we also wish to address the so phenomena associated with the PQ systems. Oh, the EQ systems. Thanks, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? You seem to have uh, some chip chip type what, what oh, actually, in this case, the, the it's not really a tap shift. There is a shift due to some phases, so it will not become a polynomial anymore. Right. The, 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 the equation is too long and complicated, so I didn't show. In this case, we did calculate all the spectral curves. It's not algebraic. Mm, no. is a combination of new view and also the space coordinates. Yeah. In the linear string theory, you can also imagine matters. So it's a combination. The real part corresponds to new view, the image part corresponds to the CFT. That, that's why it's compact. Uh, other questions? Uh, if not, let's uh, kind of chat again.